All right, so uh, let's continue on with our next presentations. Um, and these will be uh, a bit of a duet uh, between Catherine Robinson, um, our Senior Project Officer within the uh, Record Keeping Standards and Advice uh, team, who many of you know, um, and also Christy Tabiri, who's our Senior Advisor and heads up our Agency Services team. Um, again, uh, well known to you, uh, probably uh, in her for her many years uh, working in the Government Records Repository, but now working more with the State Archives Collection. So Catherine, I'll hand over to you to kick us off. Good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, it's lovely to see so many people online today. Um, as Adam has noted, the framework for record keeping in New South Wales government has been strengthened. And what I'd like to do in my short um, presentation here is to actually talk to you about the changes in the State Records Act in relation to the framework for good record keeping. So firstly, as you know, the new State Records New South Wales or State Records has been given a strong role in oversighting public office record keeping. We will be focused solely on records management, record keeping, and the disposal of records in public offices. Secondly, there's an updated definition of a state record, which clarifies what is actually meant by the term state record and removes the phrase and kept from the definition to make it clear that any record made or received for use by a public office is a state record for the purposes of the act, whether it was kept or not. Um, thirdly, we have the new monitoring power, which Adam has spoken about. Um, under sections 12.5 and 12.6 of the um, revised State Records Act, State Records New South Wales will be able to issue a formal written notice to a public office, which requires the public office to conduct an assessment of its record keeping processes and records management program, and to report on the findings of that assessment to State Records New South Wales. If State Records New South Wales is not satisfied with the public officer's report or the findings of that report, then it may include information about this in its annual report. This new monitoring power recognises the importance of good record keeping as a foundation of accountability and transparency of government. And it's designed to um, support better compliance across public offices. It fits into the re responsive regulatory approach, which he, we announced last year in the new regulatory framework for the State Records Act. The other major change to the Act relates to the protections for records, with the, and these have been strengthened. So as many of you would know, under Section 21.1, it is an offence to abandon or dispose of a, a state record to transfer the ownership of a state record, to take a state record out of the state of New South Wales, or to damage, alter, or neglect a state record. The penalty units for these offences have increased from 50 penalty units to 100 penalty units, and this equates to um, $11,000. There have also been a change to the time frame in which proceedings for offences under the State Records Act can be commenced. Um, the time frame under Section 78 of the Act has been increased from within two years to within three years. And as um, Adam has noted, these particular changes to the provisions of the State Records Act will actually commence on the 31st of December this year. Um, are there any questions? Again, Catherine, for me, I think this is um, one of the really exciting reforms um, yep. of this part of the Act. I think the State Records Act um, in the past has been described as a, as a toothless tiger, as something that doesn't have yep. teeth. Yep. Um, and I think this is these provisions um, provide those teeth in a, yep. in a sort of responsible, um, responsive way Correct. Um, yep. to the importance of, of record keeping um, across um, the jurisdictions of the Act. Yes. So. Uh, it, it's yes, it is. Yeah. It is. A, it is a very um, good new statutory power that we are being given. Um, and yes, we will be obviously talking a lot more about it in the future. Um, now, someone actually has their hand up. Um, I'm just trying to work out who that is. It's David Borden. So, David, if you're able to, or if one of my colleagues could perhaps unmute you. Um, so that you could ask your question. So 
have we got David um, unmuted? Al, Hi, Catherine Al. and Martin. How are Hi. you? Hi. Good, good. Technology works. Yay. Um, just a question in regards to the assessments. We, we've we've got the new RMAT, which is which is great. It's fantastic. But it's it's it's, it's a very high level organisational based mm. assessment. Um, we've been talking internally about developing internal assessments for a, a more of a business level um, to talk about or oh, to, to ask them about how they're managing their records and whether they have business mm. processes in place and so on and so on. Is there any discussion at the state records level about developing that more business level assessment or, or um, is that something that we should d just do ourselves? Or? At this stage, David, we, we aren't talking about it. Um, uh, it's something that a public office, we're happy for a public office to develop. And we recognise, obviously, with the development of the RMAT, that it is high level and needs to be supported by that business um, assessment processes. So having that business level assessment will obviously help you with your um, responses for the RMAT. Um, in other words, they fit together quite nicely. So if you are keen to um, look at uh, business business level assessment, um, we would encourage you to be doing that as right. part of your performance monitoring. Yep. Yeah, that we've, we've already sort of working towards that, but I just wanted to clarify whether you guys are doing yeah. anything because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. No worries. No, Thank no, you. no. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I encourage you to do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think to um, Catherine, you know, the RMAT also has that flexibility that if you can, hmm. at that um, sort of, uh, ability to analyze your own business um, and mm. compliance that you can pick and choose questions to actually yeah. test within your agency as yeah. well and, yeah. Yeah. and drill down to business unit level yeah. or whatever it might be so there's certainly that flexibility and please feel free uh, please do use the rmat um, beyond um, our sort of annual compliance uh, exercises it's it's a yeah. tool there for you to use yep definitely any other questions for Catherine before we move on? We do have a couple there. We have a question, uh, Catherine, from Rebecca Coombs. Uh, Rebecca has asked, will you be targeting agencies that have not transferred their archives in the past? I guess that's more in relation to Christy, though. Um, yeah. Christy would be a better yeah. place to answer might, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there is a question from Peter Heron. Uh, Peter's asking, can I anonymously report violations of offences against the legally required retention of records? Um, Peter, yes, you can. And I'd also encourage you to look at the upcoming public interest, the changes to the Public Interest Disclosures Act, and if necessary, using the PID to make those kinds of um, reports. Right. Thank you. Um, there was actually, yeah, there Jeanette was a question. About the, the, they've assessed individual units. Um, Christopher has asked a question, Catherine, about um, how state records will assess um, or when to initiate, assess how, when to initiate inquiries of an agency regarding its compliance with the Act. Okay, um, currently we have a range of processes already in place. Um, so under the current Act, we already have a monitoring power under Section 12. We also have an inspection power under Section 15, and we already use these powers. Um, so for instance, this year's monitoring exercise was conducted under Section 12. When we receive complaints about poor record keeping in a public office, we use our powers under Section 15 to initiate Initiate contact with a public office and to request information which would enable us to understand the complaint that has been made. So um, we have a risk pro process and a triage process that we already use and we would also be um, expanding that as part of the use of this new statutory power. So I guess sort of response to a complaint is, yeah. is one such trigger that would yeah. um, would uh, call that. Mary, you've just come back online. Did you have anything to add to that? Uh, um, yes, I'm coming online because it's a very interesting discussion. I just thought I'd show my face. Um, the, the other thing I, I would just make the observation is, is of course, um, yeah, as a best practice regulator, you, we have the regulatory triangle and, and so we escalate the use of powers um, in accordance with the response of the regulated entity. 
And so we will continue to work very, very constructively with all public officers and, and really looking to have a greater focus on education and recognising the importance of supporting you in your conversations with your senior executives about the importance of record keeping. So we absolutely see you know, those functions continuing to be really important. So although we've got additional powers, uh, we are still looking at business improvements around some of the other work that we are already doing um, with you. Thanks, Mary. Um, Cathy's asked about whether the Standards Australian, uh, Standards Australia in relation to records management, record keeping, handoff would be an acceptable measure for um, record keeping controls in a business unit. What have thought of the Bible like, isn't it, Cathy? Well, um, as the um, editor of the new compliance handbook, which is yet to be delivered to Standards Australia, um, I can say that, yes, you would be able to use it for a an assessment of a business unit, and it's based around the International Standard on Records Management, which has been adopted as a code of best practice for New South Wales. So I would encourage you to use the handbook um, for doing those assessments of business units. But at this stage, the new handbook is not available yet. So um, it might be a case of looking at other other assessment tools at this point in time. Well, Joe's asked about the penalty units, if you can just go over those yeah. specifically whether yeah. you can do several fines per record keeping assessment. Yes. Okay, Joe. Um, obviously the penalty units have increased. So it increased from five and a half thousand dollars to eleven thousand um, dollars. We have never taken an action, so we have no tangible um, information about how it would be applied. As far as we are aware, it could be applied per offence or it could be applied per record. Um, and until it's actually tested in a court of law, we obviously can't sort of um, give you anything more sort of tangible than that at this point in time. Um, I think to the, while those penalty units exist, the intention is uh, of course, to ensure that people comply with their record keeping obligations Correct. in the first place and for us yep. to work cooperatively and yep. collaboratively where possible to achieve <laughs> exactly. that. Yep. The, the penalty units isn't our first port of call. So. Yeah, no, no, exactly. And as obviously, well, 20 years into the State Records Act, we haven't used them, but they're there as a deterrent um, and they're there to be used if required. Um, but as I said, they haven't been tested in law, so in a court of law. So we obviously still have questions ourselves about how how they would actually be applied, whether it's by record or by offence. Yeah. Um, Catherine, Jeanette has asked about strengthening data governance um, and ensuring that um, data is actually uh, governed and, and um, managed compliantly with the State Records Act. Yeah. Okay, um, this comes back to whether or not data is considered a state record. And I'm very happy to say data is a state record. Um, data is part of the information network that is part of a state record. One of the things that we will be doing in the next year is um, reviewing and renewing the state records regulation. And we will be making it quite clear in the state records regulation that data is part and, part and parcel of that information that is created, received by a public office and is part of a state record. So um, starting at that point, recognising that data is part of the the tapestry of a state record. Um, obviously, the governance of data can also then be escalated and raised within your governance structures because it is part of the important um, transparent and accountability, uh, uh, transparency and accountability of good government. So, at this stage, um, it's a it's a work in progress. Um, obviously, we'll be keeping everybody informed when the regulation is renewed and um, released. But I can say to you that we will be including data in that regulation. Yeah, great. Um, Caroline's asked about the transfer of um, material required as state archives, whether that's an interaction with museums of history rather than state records. It's an interaction with museums of history, Caroline. Um, so. Um, Christy, who is our next presenter specifically, um, her area of our organisation um, will be managing that process of transfer and transfer plans. 
Um, finally, uh, before we move on, and we've got time for questions at the whole end of the forum, um, but Brennan has asked about uh, this, the, the point in one of Adam's slides around state records directing a public office to investigate its record keeping um, and whether state records will have powers to conduct the investigation directly. Okay, the statutory power in the Act is one which enables state records to direct the public office to do the investigation and do the assessment and to report the findings of that assessment. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with some matters under our Section 15 powers of inspection, we do obviously look at doing assessments ourselves, but the new statutory power is to actually direct the public office to conduct the assessment themselves and to report the findings of that assessment to us. Yeah. Mary, I don't know whether, you, did you want to comment on that at all at this stage or? No, I, I think I think the point remains that we, we continue to have our existing powers and this is an amplification of powers and and again um it, it, it's the emphasis on the responsibility of the public office to be responsible for its record so the the dynamic of the act still rests that responsibility with public office and with the act, with the agency um and i think one of the things we've been working and thinking about is how do we support you to ensure even further to ensure agency compliance um, because voluntary compliance is just much better than the use of you know, coercive powers, either by way of investigation or by notice. Yeah, indeed. All right, um, Catherine, thank you. I, I think we'll move on. Um, I, I've noted Cathy's uh, question there, which we'll try and get to at the end. Or Cathy, as always, and indeed for anyone on the forum today, if we can't get to your question um, today, please um, contact us um, and I'll provide some contact details um, at the end of today's sessions uh, with any questions or comments that you have as always. Right. So thanks Catherine and we'll see you again you. Uh, a little bit later. Um, but Christy over to you um, in terms of transfer provisions and access provisions please. So good morning everyone. Um... As Martin's already suggested, a lot of you probably know me from my many years with the Government Records Repository. I'm now with um, the Agency Services team and we will be part of Museums of History New South Wales. So um, we will continue to be responsible for the transfer of state archives into the state archives collection. And also we assist public officers with the registration of access directions. So the changes that are happening to the State Records Act to parts four and part six will be administered by us from within museums of history. Um, now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about in my presentation, Adam's already covered, so we'll go through it again and there'll be an opportunity to answer questions at the end. So there's already been some questions pop up. Um, as advised, there's a 12 month transition period. I've said it commences on the 1st of January, 2023. Adam said it was the 31st of December, 2022, when we come into effect. Um, but basically, we've got all of 2023 to transition the changes to the new requirement for transfer plans and the changes to the access conventions. So my team will be the agency services team. We will be um, available to assist public officers throughout the entirety of 2023. Um, we'll be communicating the changes to access directions. Um, we'll liaise with public officers around the records that they create and discuss sensitivity, whether or not closed access directions will need to be created, whether or not um, they already have some closed to public access directions that will need to be renewed. So we'll be, contact, we'll be reaching out and contacting you through 2023. Um, we'll also be working to determine the requirements for the new requirement of transfer plans. So we'll also be communicating them at the same time as we're contacting you regarding the access direction changes. So as part of the work that is happening, a lot of you have already heard about the State Archives portal. So we're going to be developing some new tools that you'll be able to log in 
and make some of these changes. So hopefully that will make life easier. Um, we're trying to move away from traditional forms um, and make a tool that you can log in and actually update, view, submit. Um, so the online tool we're planning will enable you to submit your transfer plans from 2024 onwards. Um, view the access directions that your public office currently has registered for use with us. Um, renew the closed access directions. Um, that's going to have to happen every five years going forward. Um, it'll enable you to revoke closed access directions when required. And it will also allow you to register new closed access directions or create early access notifications as well. So. So that's the transfer and transition arrangements, and all of this will come into effect of 2024. So some parts of the amendments to the State Records Act do come into effect immediately, the parts relating to parts two and three, as Catherine's advised, but for changes for parts four and six, they actually don't come into effect until 2024. So we've got plenty of time to work with public officers and reach out and liaise with you, so. So, First part I want to talk about, thanks Al, is um, the transferring records of enduring value into the State Archives collection. So this is a new requirement for people to submit transfer plans, um, and that's going to be added into part four of the State Records Act amendments. Um, the aim of this new requirement is the preservation and protection of State Archives. So transfer into the collection removes the risk that public officers currently have to store and manage and make the archives accessible. Um, so this will become the responsibility of Museums of History in New South Wales. The material, the information that we do receive during transfer plans, um, we're going to use for strategic and operational planning, and that will be used to support the function of transfer into the State Archives collection. Um, it'll be a benefit to us to know if you have a record set that you're considering transferring, um, it will also be useful for us to actually provide advice to you when it comes to the point of transfer. So we can sort of look at our own internal processes and resourcing. Um, the transfer plans will be described by a regulation and those regulations to the State Records Act will be issued during 2023. So they haven't been drafted yet, we, we're doing that. And the initial transfer plans will be required in 2024 onwards. So a new plan will be submitted, every, we will request one every five years. It's not going to be as frequent as the records management assessment tool, um, which is an annual exercise. So this is once every five years. Um, and that's in line with, if you have got closed access directions, you're gonna to have to renew those every five years. And so, we thought that that was a nice trigger point for you to just sort of, to sort of do some records and archives housekeeping. Um, as already advised on the transition slide, um, we are developing an online tool with fields that you'll be able to complete to submit the required information. Um, and the type of information that we're going to be asking for in a transfer plan is going to be quite high level. It's not going to be um, great detail of you need to tell us if you have, you know, 6,000 files relating to planning infrastructure or something like that. So it'll be quite broad, high level, um, an estimate of the quantity of the archives that you've got held, um, the format. So the transfer plan does apply to physical and digital records. So, um, and format can also include things like audio visual records, um, paper records, um, electronic records. Um, a description of the type of records you've got, so you will be able to submit additional information. And ultimately, when you think that they'll be transferred to the State Archives collection. So, um, like I said, that will be useful for us for our operational planning. Um, and it will also actually bring it a bit more front of mind as well for the public officers um, to manage the archives that they hold. Next slide, please, Al. The biggest change potentially is the changes to access that are happening in part six of the State Records Act. So, um, and I know that Adam has gone across a lot of this already. So, but 
access to state records enables the citizens of New South Wales timely access to the records documenting the government's activities and decisions. Um, it's a right in a democratic society for people to actually be able to access records. Um, as a result of that, the open access period is being reduced from 30 years to 20 years and records will be open to the public access by default once they are 20 years old. So the change in the open access period, as Adam already advised, is in line with what National Archives have done um, and in line with current archival thinking and community expectations about record keeping and government accountability. Closed public access directions can still be registered. Um, they will need to be actively renewed every five years. Um, so, like I said, the online tool that we're building should actually make that a lot easier to do. Um, you will be notified when something's coming up for renewal. Um, and yeah, the close to public access directions, we acknowledge still that there are sensitive material, personal information, security material that government creates that aren't appropriate to be open after 20 years. So we'll be actually reaching out and contacting public officers. Um, we've already started working on having a look at all the public sector that we're across, uh, having a look at what's already been transferred into the State Archives collection, having to think about what state records are not in the State Archives collection, are never going to be required to State Archives, but you still will be covered by the access direction provisions. Um, and yeah, we're sort of building up some information for when we actually contact you in 2023. Similarly, early access notifications can still be registered. So you don't need to hold on to your records and wait until they're 20 years old in order for them to be open to the public. You can still open them proactively early. There will be less of a need to set an access direction when transferring state archives in the future. So, if you're happy to transfer and you're happy for the material to be accessible after 20 years, you will not need to provide us with an access direction for that. However, if you are transferring material into the State Archives collection and it has got the sensitivities, you can actually apply a closed access direction to that material. Um, so there's no change to the capacity for a public office to apply a direction that closes records to public access when transferring as State Archives. But similarly, in the future from 2024, you can transfer and not have to apply an access direction and it will be open when it reaches the 20 year mark. So next slide, please, Al. All right, so this is just a bit of what happens next. So what you can do to prepare, um, because we've already started working on planning for this transition period for these changes. Um, but there are some things that you can do within your organisations as well. So for the transfer planning, think about the records that you hold that are required as state archives. So your disposal authorities um, that are approved for your use will give you some indication of what records you are potentially holding um, that are required. Have a think about if you're aware of any legacy digital systems or if you know that there's somewhere where there's a stash of old physical records that potentially may hold archives, you can probably start thinking about them and maybe raising awareness within your organisation about those records. Um, and consider your response to the RMAT question 18, which is about transfer. So you've already been asked about transfer and transfer um, activities. So this sort of dovetails nicely with that, and you can consider that when you're looking at completing the 2023 assessment task as well. For the access provisions, have a think about the records that you create and their sensitivity. So have a think about whether or not they can be open after 20 years, or do they need to be closed for a longer period? Um, also have a think about the records that you already provide public access to at 30 years. Um, the intent is to maintain open access to records that have already been considered open, so we will discuss that with you. The intent is not for agencies to close material unnecessarily, um, that's not in the public interest. Um, and the same, consider your previous response to RMAC question 19. So um, you already asked about access directions in that question, so just have that in mind as well. 
We have got advice on the website. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the website further on in the presentation, but um, there is advice on the website around public access to records. Um, and you can always contact us. So we've got we've got our contact details at the end of the presentation slides. So if you think of any questions after this presentation is over or you have something that you're really concerned about, feel free to reach out and contact us. So I know we had some questions earlier. Great, thanks, Christy. I'll get to as many questions as I can, but thank you for that presentation. No worries. Um, inevitably, you know I'm going to say something, don't you? Of course you are. Go for your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, look, just to reiterate your points, for both the changes to parts four and six, particularly part four, we recognise that this is additional work for many agencies. That's why there is a 12 month transition period for both of these provisions. We've, we've got a full 12 months um, to work our way through this uh, and any issues with you. Um, the team at what will be Museums of History in New South Wales has been resourced to provide you with that assistance. So we're here. Um, we also are very determined to have a customer focus um, in our approach to this implementation as well. Uh, customer focus and a pragmatic approach to this. We recognise that for some agencies, this will all be fine. Um, they've already got a good idea of where their potential state archives are, what they are and when they want to transfer them and they've got their access directions. For others, um, it may not be the case and we fully recognise that. Um, and therefore will be proactively contacting um, agencies and particularly um, high risk, what we would deem high risk agencies um, and particularly around um, the access provisions. The last thing that we want um, is the unintended consequence um, of public officers um, that it's just easier to close the records. Um, we, we don't want that. That's not the spirit of the legislation and we will be working hard um, with you over the 12 months um, that we have in 2023 to ensure we don't have those, you know, sort of knee-jerk um, responses to the legislation. We have the time and we have the resources to provide you um, with that assistance. I think too, um, it's uh, both of these both both of these provisions, but particularly the transfer planning, is an evolving piece of work as well. Um, the requirement is that you provide us with a transfer plan, um, but fully acknowledging that for some of you, as I said, that's a more difficult task. Some that's an easier task, and so again, we're taking a pragmatic approach and the ability for you to sort of update plans. Um, within that sort of five year um, time period um, that we have that we'll have that requirement for actually formally submitting a transfer plan. So that provision in particular is all designed to improve um, the management of uh, future state archives and um, you know certainly uh, we're very keen on doing the work with you um, as our customers and as our stakeholders to ensure these provisions of the Act are successfully and sensibly um, uh, introduced. We had a question in particular, which is great uh, for um, from Sally about um, what, what happens if you don't renew your close to public access direction. Um, and look, we will talk to people individually. We will be making that proactive contact, Sally, but we will also be sensible um, in terms of should that occur um, at the beginning of 2024. Um, we will be talking to you um, about should should that be the case. Um, Christopher's question um, also relates to whether the reduced access period applies just from now on or retrospectively. Uh, it is applied retrospectively, Christopher. Um, and specifically, I think we need to shout out that it's not just state archives, it is state records. So it does relate to records um, still in your custody that aren't required as state archives. There is no change to that provision. That's the current state of the State Records Act and has been since 1998, um, that the access provisions relate to state records, not just state archives. Um, but I think we people should be aware of that. 
Um, Jeanette's asked about uh, whether considerations being given to Indigenous cultural records or artefacts that may have different requirements and presumably Jeanette different access requirements. Um, that hasn't been specifically addressed in the legislation. Um, that is, however, uh, a matter for uh, each public office that might hold such material um, for you to um, consider um, the access around that material and the suitability of access around that uh, material. Um, uh, Marina has asked about which agencies we consider high risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Christy, do you want to take that one? <laughs> without, sure. With, without naming names, perhaps? Well, we're basically assessing it based on material that we think is high security risk record um, agencies that we know create sensitive records um, and agencies that do collect a lot of personal information on individuals. So um, those agencies do currently have some really good coverage of access direction. So it'd be a matter of talking to them and renewing some of the access directions for some of those agencies. But yeah, basically, we're, we, we're trying to be pragmatic, as Martin said, and we're trying to keep in mind, we don't want this to be an onerous task for people, but it is something we still need to reach out to people and, and work with you on. Um, yeah, I suppose personal information, um, keeping in mind provisions of the other privacy legislations out there um, is sort of what we're focused on at this point, as well as security material. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, Warwick's asked about whether there's any appeal or review rights when records are closed. Um, hi, Warwick. Um, there are no uh, no appeal or review rights. That hasn't that isn't one of the changes that was made as part of the Act. Um, it remains status quo that there is not that. Um, state that what will become Museums of History in New South Wales can certainly ask a public office to. Um, review an access direction um, or the minister responsible to review that access direction. But for members of the public, um, there is no um, review mechanism or appeal mechanism, um, as is the current case, that, that status quo. Um, Aline has asked about the use of um, the government information classification labelling and handling guidelines. Good idea to identify sensitive records. Um, Christy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would have thought a good tool to one of the tools that could be used there. They could be. Um, just bear in mind, but that those sensitivity classifications are often applied to the sensitivity record at that point in time that might not have the same level of sensitivity 20 years down the track. So, yes, it's a good guide, but it doesn't need to be a set in stone guide. Yeah, indeed. Um, Paul's asked about whether it'd be worthwhile uh, about a clearer framework about what could be eligible for a CPA. Um, and I think this harks, yes. Christy, to someone else's question, related to someone else's question around sort of generic access directions for particular records. Do you want to yeah. take that? Take yep, that? absolutely. So we are looking at developing a suite of fairly standardised access directions that people can use. We know that a lot of people get overwhelmed with the amount of information and advice sometimes and they just want some clear guidance a lot of time we're asked what do other people do so we are going to um, create a suite of standardized access directions that's not to say that you couldn't actually create your own um, customized ones but that is our intent to do that um, sorry what was the other part that paul asked about um it's around sort of just being clear about the sensitivity, um, oh, you know, that, that relates yeah. to perhaps other legislation yeah. such as yeah. yeah, so we are going to do that as part of the work we're doing as well. We're actually, um, and this was suggested by a public office who we were speaking to, um, we're actually going to look at developing like a decision making tree to sort of assist with guiding when something is considered sensitive and when you should consider enclosing it, because um, we think that might be a benefit as well. It's just a clear cut sort of work your way through the steps and decide whether or not um, something is sensitive and should be closed. So we're looking at doing that as well to guide this work or to support this work. Yeah, indeed. Um, and look, um, 
this is all great feedback for us as well mm. this year, of course. Um, and, and I'd encourage people to um, contact us about their thoughts around um, improving that uh, guidance around access as well. Um, you can see in our annual report uh, at any particular year that um, since 1998, uh, we're now at a rate of around 55% of all public officers having comprehensive access directions. Uh, we absolutely want to improve that. Mm -hmm. um, and in doing that, we need to, of course, uh, take that very customer focused approach um, and also um, employ those tools such as the online portal to make it easy for people to do. Um, but also, and I can see Tony, your comment around also having things like the model access directions for common records um, mm -hmm. makes good sense to me uh, around that. So. Um, I think we've pretty much covered a lot of them. Um, Nairi's asked about whether there was a, has been a regulatory impact statement on transfer and access aspects. Um, Nairi, that's really a matter for the cabinet process um, that approved the legislation um, and not really one that I can comment on. However, um, at an operational level, we absolutely do recognise that um, these provisions um, perhaps less so the access ones, because I think so many agencies have already sort of made those decisions and it's just a matter of updating or renewing um, some of those decisions, but the transfer one that does involve more work, um, absolutely. And as I said, um, we're here to make that process um, as, um, not necessarily as easy, but as pragmatic for you as, as possible. Um, Jane's asked about furniture. Mm. Yes, that was an earlier question. Do you want to take that one? Um, well, want... the furniture is not really something it's that archive. it's not a state record or it's not required as a state archive. So, um, no, we won't be requiring details of furniture um, as part of transfer plans. I think it was in the lens of transfer plans that Jane asked the question. Yeah. 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 So, okay. no, no. Um, the definition of a record hasn't changed to that extent. So, no, no objects. Um, that said, of course, Jane, um, you know, our new context of operating is um, the partnership with Sydney Living Museums. And so our collection um, is therefore beyond the bounds of the State Archives collection. So um, I'm, I'm not saying uh, we want to take uh, furniture, tables, chairs, cutlery, crockery. I'm not saying that. Um, but if there are significant pieces of um, cultural heritage, um, that come across, while they may not be a state record, um, perhaps wearing sort of uh, our other hats of the other side of our business around a museum organisation, we may be interested in speaking to you about that material. Um, so, uh, Jane, yes, by all means, do retain it um, and, and fully appreciate its significance, by all means. And I think Rebecca had a question as well. Uh, That's, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll just circle back to that. Um, Rebecca asked earlier, uh, will you be targeting agencies that haven't transferred in the past? So we won't be targeting as such. Um, that sounds like a terrible word, but, terrible term, yeah. <laughs> um, but we will be using that information to actually reach out and offer support to agencies who haven't transferred before. I know sometimes there's been a bit of a reputation that transfer is all very obscure and mystical and difficult. Um, we don't want it to be like that. Um, and if agencies haven't transferred, um, we're not going to be contacting you and asking you why haven't you transferred, you've got nothing on your transfer plan, but it will enable us to reach out and just offer support and work with agencies. So I hope that answers that question, Rebecca. Great. Thanks, Christy. Um, we had a couple of questions in advance, mm -hmm. Christy, as you know. Yep. Um, the first one was around providing detail on the requirements around transfer plans and changes to access. I think we've covered yeah. that one pretty well. Um, and the other one was whether there was any, any intended change to the status quo where state archives are returned on premises um, at institutions such as universities. Um, and uh, just for us to be clear on that, there are no changes um, to uh, distributed management agreements or anything like that um, in the new legislation. That is status quo around that. Mm -hmm. um, Emma's asked about that there's no 
she was of the understanding that there's uh, no room at State Archives for us to transfer. Um, no, that's not the case. <laughs> that's not the case. No. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about transfer, Emma. Yes. Uh, so, so please, please do contact us.